Hey, well, if we have not met, my name is Hannah, and I am one of the other pastors out here at Mission Hill, and I'm excited to bring the word to you this morning. We've been looking at the description of who Jesus is in Isaiah 9-6, and so far we've talked about how he is our wonderful counselor, he is the mighty God, and today we're going to look at how he is our everlasting Father. So let's read Isaiah 9-6 together this morning just to refresh ourselves. It says, For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Now, I don't know about you, but the concept of something lasting forever is hard for us at times to understand. We may feel that things last forever, but we know that everything in life has a clear start and a clear end date. You know, I remember as a kid, our family liked to go to Colorado a lot for vacation, and that eight-hour drive felt like eternity. And I'm sure that my brother and sister and I annoyed my parents to death because we just felt like it was forever. Even sometimes the hour drive to see our relatives in Kansas City also felt like forever to me as a kid. And as you get older, you kind of, you know, learn the concept of time and some of those things, and it gets better and it gets easier Maybe for you right now, you feel like COVID is lasting forever. It feels like it will never be over. It will never come to an end. But we all know that it will. It eventually will. And we pray that it comes soon. Maybe you're in school and you feel like you will never be done. You will never finish all of your homework. You will never graduate. You will never make it. But you will. You will. And in all of our lives, we have these moments where we think we can catch a glimpse of what something that is forever feels like. But it's nothing in comparison to what true forever is. And true forever is Jesus. It's Jesus. And in our lives, we try to mark a lot of these special moments with beginnings and endings. You know, if you've ever been in a relationship, if you're old like me, what do you do? You put it on your Facebook. You put on your Facebook that you're in a relationship starting May 10th, 2009. I started dating Josh, right? If you're young, you're Gen Z, and you're really cool, you'd put it on your Instagram bio, you know, you'd put Taken or something like cute that is um, not, no longer cool for me to do anymore. But, uh, you know, we put these beginning dates on a lot of things in our lives to mark them. You know, I didn't actually know, this is a fun random story, I didn't actually know that Josh and I's first date was our first date. Have you heard this story before? Well, you're going to hear it today. So I was 16, and Josh had come to my 16th birthday party. And we like, were kind of interested in each other. We had really been enemies for a while before this. And now we were interested in each other. And, and I'm opening all the presents at my party. All my friends are there. It's this just awesome time. And Josh looks at me and he goes, well, I forgot to get you a present. And I thought, hmm, OK. This is off to a great start. And he says, well, how about I take you to the movies for your gift? And I was like, that's pretty slick. And so I'm thinking that something's going on. Well, so we show up to the movies on May 10th. We saw Maid of Honor, which was a very average movie. Very average, very, very average, average movie. And we show up, and we had driven ourselves there. And I see Josh get out of his car. And I dressed kind of nice, casual, you know, nothing too fancy for the movies. And Josh gets out of his car, and he's wearing these bright blue sweatpants, like electric blue sweatpants that I never saw him wear before that, and I never saw him wear them again after that moment. And so I think to myself, I'm like, we are not on a date. Who would show up to a date in bright blue sweatpants? And so, you know, we go into the movie, and we leave, and we're like, bye, see you later. And and a week later, you know, he says to me, he goes, we are dating, right? Like, that was our first date. And I said, you bet. And that's how our relationship began. So there's a little, <laughs> little fun story to just get us going today. But on May 10th, 2009, that was our very first date and the beginning of what has been just a true adventure in our lives. And we all have these different ways of marking different things. Maybe you put it on your calendar. You put it on your social media. Maybe it's something in your house. You know, we throw parties. We give gifts. We make time-sensitive things memorable. And we do the same when things come to an end. We celebrate, we give honor, we remember, we etch people's memory into stone from start to finish. And we get this. We get this kind of thing. 
So when it comes to thinking about what forever actually is and what forever could feel like, we honestly, I mean, if you're like me, it's like I have no idea how to even begin to grasp what forever will be. And I think that's why it's so hard sometimes for us to grasp a God who is forever, a God who didn't have a birthday and who will never have a death date. He always has been and always will be. And it's one of the neatest things about God is that he will never come to an end. He will never come to an end. He always was and always will be. In Isaiah 9-7, it tells us this. And I apologize, the verse I'm reading on my iPad is a different translation than on the screen. But it says, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And then again in Revelation 22:13, it tells us this. God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the last, the first and the end. God is everlasting. He was the inspiration behind Willy Wonka's everlasting gobstopper. I mean, how awesome would that be if you had candy that never ran out and never lost its flavor? You would save so much money and probably have a lot of cavities. But it would be incredible if things were truly everlasting. This is who our God is. He is forever. His love never runs out. He will never abandon you. He will never leave you. He is forever. He is the best kind of forever. He is the kind of forever that we honestly never want to end. And I'm so thankful that he never will. But we know that God is more than just eternal. So if you're taking notes this morning, the first thing you would want to write down is that God is forever. This is what we learned. God is forever. And the second thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at how God is our Father, because that's the second descriptor in this portion of Scripture. He is our everlasting Father. And you know, I'm very biased, but I personally think I have the greatest dad ever, and he's sitting right back there. I think he is the world's greatest dad, and now Josh would tell you that he thinks he has the world's greatest dad, and he's sitting over there, and we've really battled it out over the years, and we've come to just agree they're both pretty awesome. They're both pretty great, and there's many of you in the room who you would say, your dad is just the greatest. He's awesome. And maybe there's others of you who that's not really been your experience. Maybe your relationship with your dad is awkward. Maybe it's been distant. Maybe it's been tense at times. And when we talk about God as our father, we can easily project onto him whatever our personal experience has been, whether it's been good or whether it's been bad. And my encouragement for you today is this, to learn to see God as your perfect father. He is in a category all to himself. No one can compete with him. No one can compare to him as great as our dads are. They would tell you they're not perfect. They probably would say it to you right now because we all know that we are not perfect. We all have limits. We all make mistakes. We all do things that aren't perfect because we're not perfect people and we weren't created to be. But God himself, he is perfect. He is perfect. And all of the good experiences and examples that we can have in our lives, our relationships with the people around us, they are just a small glimpse. They're a shadow. They're a reflection of who God himself is. We get glimpses of his love. We get glimpses of his power. We get glimpses of his goodness through all of the people we encounter in life. And this is why it's so important that we do our best to reflect who Christ is, right? We all want to do our very best to be the best reflection of the goodness of God, the goodness of the Father. But when we look to God, we see the full picture. When we look around to us, we catch these small glimpses, but when we look to him alone, we're able to see fully what goodness is, fully what love is, fully what power is. And that's why in life we live to serve God and we don't live to serve people. Because people will let us down at times. They will. But God never will. And we cannot find our ultimate source of love and purpose in the people around us. God has to be that source. And for you this morning, maybe you haven't had the world's greatest experience with your dad. Man, there is a dad who loves you, and his name is Jesus. And he is ready this morning to pour out that love on you that maybe you have never experienced in your life. Psalm 103.8 tells us this about how God loves us. It says, the Lord is compassionate 
and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. And this is the second thing that we learn about God as our everlasting Father this morning. God is full of perfect love and compassion for us. Full of perfect love and compassion for us. The well of his love will never run dry. You could take buckets of it out every day and it would never, you would never be able to empty it. His love is perfect. It's without flaw. It's without blemish. And just like the concept of forever, it's something that can be really difficult for us to grasp at times because we will never experience perfect love truly in this life outside of him. Even the greatest relationship you can have with your spouse, with a parent, with your child pales in comparison to the love that God has for you. And the best part about God is that you don't have to prove yourself to him. You don't have to clean yourself up in order to come to him. You don't have to know all the answers or have your life perfectly in order. And you don't ever have to wonder if he loves you. He just does. He just does. He is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. You know, for me as a kid, I always knew my parents were proud of me. No matter what I did, as long as I kind of tried, as long as I put in some basic effort, they were proud of what I did. And I tried a lot of things that I was not good at. One of them was uh, my phase in middle school where I, I thought I would try out basketball. It was not a good time. I was terrible. I was terrible. And I actually, I had a flashback while I was writing this um, to when Steve and Angela had just moved to Topeka. They were my youth pastors for a very small window of time before planning Mission Hill. And they showed up to my middle school basketball game, and I wasn't expecting them to. And I had two very conflicting emotions when they walked in the door. Number one, I thought, how cool. My youth pastors, who I don't even know, didn't even tell them I had this game. They showed up to watch me play. And then I felt another emotion, and that was just pure embarrassment because I was so terrible. I was so terrible. I think the whole season I scored maybe two goals. I mean, it was ugly, but I tried. I tried. I tried my best. And, you know, I never felt like I really had to earn the approval or the love of a lot of people in my life. I've been very blessed in that way. But I've had other friends over the years who were driven by this need to prove themselves to their parents or to prove themselves to their teachers, to different people in their life. They had to be the best at everything in order to feel loved. And this is not the type of father who we have in God. You do not have to have it all perfect to come to him. He loves you as is. And if you hear anything this morning, it's this. Stop trying to prove yourself to God. Stop trying to prove yourself to God. Stop trying to be good enough Stop trying to do enough. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't work to become more like him, that you shouldn't work in your life to be obedient and to develop good habits. All of that is good. But stop doing it out of the motive of if you don't, he won't love you because that's not how his love operates. Aren't you so thankful for that this morning? I know I sure am. You are enough. You are doing good enough, especially right now during COVID. You are doing incredible if no one else is telling you that right now, you are doing incredible and God is pleased. He is pleased. And he is full of compassion and love for you. And he's ready to pour it out over your life. Even if right now you feel like no one else is doing that for you, he is ready. And I don't know at times why we do this, but sometimes it's like we try to limit how much we'll let God love us. You know, if you feel like you're struggling, if you feel like you don't have it together, you're like, God, just... Keep, keep the love back. And I don't know why we do that. It doesn't make sense why we tend to hinder and block him from fully loving us when we are in the moments where we need him the most. When we allow God to love us in those very moments, it can change everything in your life. When we're willing to take down the walls and the barriers, look, they're not blocking him from seeing what's going on anyway. He can see it all. He can see it all, and so let him in fully because his love will change your life and his love will be the difference in the difficult moments of your life. The third thing that we learn about God is that because he's so good, he wants to give you rest. He wants to give you rest. And, you know, we live in a culture that doesn't really um, prioritize rest. We don't. Our culture tells you you need to hustle, you need to hurry, you need to be productive, and I can fall into that really kind of toxic way of thinking 
where I find my purpose and my worth in accomplishing things instead of in just being close to Jesus and like having a normal schedule and a normal life. And God wants to give us rest. It's the example that he sets for us himself when he creates the world. He does, you know, one of the greatest things throughout the scriptures. And what does he do? He takes rest. Even though he's God, he didn't need it. But he does it to set an example for us that we would know that we need to rest as well. And at the end of the year, I don't know, it's probably the same for you, but December feels like this sprint to the finish. No matter what's going on, whether it's been a crazy year or a really calm year, it feels like this sprint to get everything you need to get accomplished. I'm trying to finish all of the books that I started and I bought this year that are half finished. I'm trying to finish up my Christmas gifts. I'm trying to finish up all the last minute things that we need to do for the church this year. And honestly, right now, I feel like I'm trying to make it to Christmas without losing my mind. I'm trying to make it to Christmas, and that's not how God wants me to feel. He doesn't want me to feel like I am just cranking out all this work and I'm barely having enough steam to keep going. He wants me to feel rested in the midst of the chaos and the crazy because when I rest, he will sustain me. When we take the time to prioritize rest in our life, it makes everything else a whole lot easier. It does. But so often we feel like we can't afford to take a rest. We can't afford to take a break. And God's like, stop. Stop doing that. Stop thinking that way. And he's beckoning us to find true peace and rest in him. In Matthew 11, 28 and 29, Jesus says this. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Do you know what I've really learned in the last year? It's going to be okay if I don't get all my projects done. I will live. I will live. It's going to be okay. And I love to do projects. I do. I love it. And especially during COVID, when we've been quarantined, we've had less to do. I have really thrown myself into a lot of projects, which has been great but I've also learned to throw myself into times of rest, to throw myself into times where I just lay everything else aside and I just find that peace and connection that only comes from Jesus. And I learned this really well about a year ago. Some of you, you may be familiar with this story, but about a year ago, I had a really crazy lung infection. It was before COVID. I'll be curious to see once I see my pulmonologist in February, if he thinks it was COVID, who knows? But I had this awful lung infection. Um, it was so bad. The pain was so intense. I hadn't slept for three days. I wound up in the ER. I had about 10 different tests done before they could finally figure out and be able to see what was happening within my lungs. It was awful. And the pain knocked me off my feet for about two months. For about two months. And I spent a lot of time just hanging out at home. What we've all been doing during COVID. Just hanging out at home. And most days, I would have the energy to get up and sit myself on the couch, and I would watch Disney Plus all day, and then I would go to bed, and that was my day. It was my day, and I remember one day in particular, it was a few weeks after we had found out what was going on with me, and I was so frustrated with how tired I felt. I was so frustrated with how much pain I was in, and I remember I had thought to myself that day, I thought, wow, all you did today was sit around and put the laundry in the washer. You didn't even put the laundry in the dryer. You didn't even put it away. You had the whole day to just do one load of laundry, and you couldn't even do it. And the Lord spoke to me in that moment, and he said, that was good enough, because today, you know what you did? You made time for me. And every day during that time, I would sit down at the end of my day, and I would just read through the Psalms. I would read through the Psalms, and I would, I would write out some of the scriptures sometimes, because it I was in this place of just sheer desperation because of how much physical pain I was in. And that was good enough. It was more than good enough because it was exactly what I needed to be doing during that time. You know, there's these times in our lives where we feel really limited. Maybe right now, I mean, because of COVID, we're so limited on some of the things we can do. Maybe at times like me, you've been physically limited because of something that has happened to you. Maybe you feel emotionally limited by things that are going on. And the best news is, is that when we feel limited, it's the perfect moment for us to remember that we serve a limitless God. 
We serve a limitless God whose love and compassion and grace and rest is limitless. It is available to us. So we keep going and we keep resting and trusting in him. We put our trust in his perfect love. Because when we make the time to be really close to Jesus, we really do find what real rest looks like. Real rest is not just taking like a 10-hour nap, even though that sounds really great to me right now. Real rest is connecting with Jesus. It's being close to him. But we have to learn how to do this. We have to unlearn a lot of bad habits that push us to just keep going and keep going and keep going and ignore those spiritual warning signs that are going off in our souls. We have to slow down and learn from our Father. You know, one of my favorite things to do as a kid with my dad was to watch football. That's why I am a Denver Broncos fan. We would just sit and eat snacks and watch football. It was awesome. It was awesome. And the Broncos were doing a lot better then than they are now, but we won't talk about that. But it was just this restful, just awesome activity. You know, whatever day the game was on, whether it was Sunday afternoon or or Saturday or whatever it was, we would just kind of sit down and watch football. And I didn't have to think. I didn't have to come prepared. We would just sit. And that's what it's supposed to be like when we connect with God. We just show up and we're like, here I am. You can show up with snacks too, and I think God will be okay with that if you show up to pray and read your Bible with some snacks. And he just wants you to come as you are and to just hang with him, to read his word, to listen for his voice. It's so simple. And if this year you are feeling tired in your soul, you're not alone. And the best news is when we're feeling tired, when we feel depleted, that Jesus is ready to fill us. He's ready to give us every good and perfect thing that comes from above. And all we have to do is just rest with him. This Christmas season, I want to challenge you to see Jesus as more than a cute little baby in a manger. He is the Messiah. He is the King. He is the Savior. He is our everlasting Father, who is the wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, and the Prince of Peace. He is full of perfect love and compassion for you. He is forever, and he wants to give you rest. Choose to turn your gaze to him and to look fully at who he is. He is a good father who loves you fully as you are right now in this moment, no matter how you might feel about yourself. And this Christmas, how great would it be if we really allowed his love, his grace, his compassion to just envelop our lives? I think it'd be the greatest gift of all if we really opened our hearts and our minds and our souls to let him fill us and give us what he wants. I pray that we find a new sense of rest in him because he is good and he is the everlasting father. Lord, this morning, we thank you for your love. God, I can't begin to understand the concept of forever and I definitely can't begin to understand the concept of how you love us. Of how you can see every part of who we are, all the stuff that we try to hide, all of the things that are clearly seen. God, you see it all. And you love us perfectly. God, I pray that for all of us today, we would feel just a sense of release from trying to earn your love that we would feel a sense of peace this morning in knowing that we are good. We're good. You say we're good. And while other people may let us down, God, you never will. Just like we've sung about this morning, you are faithful to the end. You are with us. You will never abandon us. You will never speak a bad word against us. You only speak what is good and true. And so, Lord, this morning we want to hear from you. God, would you remind us of how loved we are? I'm sure all of us in the room could say that we're feeling tired this morning in some way. Maybe we feel tired physically, 
tired mentally, tired emotionally. God, maybe we feel tired spiritually. Would you refresh us through your power? Would you refresh us through your presence? God, we love you. We're so grateful that at Christmas we have this wonderful reminder of who you are and of all the many aspects of who you are. God, as Josh said earlier, we could study you our whole lives and never get a full picture because that's how great you are. As we sing this last song, would you just give each of us something to leave with? You are the ultimate gift giver and you don't want anyone to leave empty-handed this morning. God, maybe some people in this room need strength. Maybe others need peace. Maybe others need hope. Maybe others just need to feel loved or to feel like what they're doing matters. God, would you speak to their hearts? Would you remind them that you see and that you love? Lord, we love you. We turn our eyes to you. You are the good and perfect Father. We pray all these things to